Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. When we aren't afraid of death, we are less afraid of life. From these episodes, I aim for all of us to take more risks in our life, go after our dreams, have great relationships, and joy in the process. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on our show, we have Sharon Babineau. Sharon is a mountain climber, a hockey player, and a decorated soldier. In fact, she's a 10-year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. She is also a widow. Sharon suffered a series of unimaginable losses in her life, including the death of her husband and six years later, the death of her daughter. Sharon is an inspirational keynote speaker and facilitates transformative mindfulness and the 16 guidelines to a happy life. For over a decade, she has been speaking from her heart, helping people access their inner strength. She believes by tapping into the power of positive thinking, we all have the ability to overcome even the most devastating of life's moments and be able to continue to live fully. Sharon is the founder of Maddie's Everlasting Wish, a nonprofit charity started in her daughter's memory. She has been recognized for the work she has done at home and in Africa and is the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Sharon Babineau is a contributing author in two of the Chicken Soul, excuse me, two of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books and the book Embrace Your Authentic Self. Her own book about her extraordinary daughter is titled The Girl Who Gave Her Wish Away. So I would like to welcome with a warm, loving welcome, uh, Miss Sharon Babineau. Sharon, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to meet you, hear your voice. We've been emailing quite a bit, and now just to get the real live person is awesome. So you've certainly been through a lot, and if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit about your story and so we can find out a little bit more who you are and how you got to be where you are right now. I'd love to big question I know but I know it's like geez where do I start I guess the beginning is always the best (laughs) always the best yes Uh, well uh, you know I was just an average child like everyone else I was very curious I like to take things apart and doorknobs and stuff and and (laughs) I mean uh, of course no one could open the doors afterwards but uh, very curious child ended up joining the military Uh, As a mechanic, one of the first females that um, served uh, with NATO overseas, and uh, it was quite an adventure, quite a difference uh, for me from from just, you know, being an ordinary kid to, like, being in a uniform, of course, very proud to to serve my country. And um, from there, I ended up in in Ottawa, Canada, and, and there I met the most amazing man. And, you know, I always wanted, you know, to, to have the family and the marriage and all of that. Uh, I met a man named Stephen who was uh, extraordinary, looked like Paul McCartney, drove a motorcycle. Uh, took a while for me to convince him I was the one for him. I knew right away he was the one for me. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, sweet. totally. Yeah. And, you know, fell in love, started planning our future just like everyone does. Sure. And, you know, I am dreaming up the, the day I'm walking down the aisle with my wedding gown on and a couple of months before we married he was diagnosed with ALS which is Lou Gehrig's disease Mm -hmm. and I think people are more familiar with it now because of the ice bucket challenge yes because you know years ago although it's a a terrible disease most people did not know about it Um, so ALS has no cure and no cause and so so Stephen was diagnosed he was young I was in my 20s I think he just turned 30 and um diagnosed with this horrible disease and basically told to go home and prepare to die we were told to split up we i was told to go my own way and carry on and and that Mm -hmm. i had a bright future in front of me find someone healthy basically and my husband was told my fiance was told to go home and live in his parents basement prepare to die so just imagine imagine that i i can't i can't Mm -hmm. the love of your life and no i can't and uh of course we're stunned and, and 
we go back home and we're having a conversation and Stephen had listened to his doctor and said, you know, Sharon, it, it, it makes sense to, to break up and you have your life in front of you. But I don't know about your listeners or yourself. I, I think when the going gets tough and you love someone, you don't walk away. No. And it's not always easy, but it can be the most rewarding time of your life. Sure. And so we made a choice to stay together, and 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 I wanted to walk side by side with him as he dealt with his illness. And so finally, he realized it wasn't from pity; it was from love that I said, you know, please let let's let's do this. Let's let's get married. And um, so we did. And but then we had this two-year death sentence, six months to two years. They gave him that was hanging over our head, and. So then we started seeing the world as um, this could be our last Christmas, our last New Year's. Right. We had a lot of anxiety. We didn't have the skill set. I think most of us don't have the skill sets to deal with something like this. No. You know, I, I didn't know how to be a caregiver, how to take care of him, and it was all trial and error. And I'm sure I dropped him a few times, and he's ran over my feet a few times with his wheelchair uh-huh. as his disease progressed. But we came to a point in our life when we realized. It wasn't benefiting us or anyone by by having this fear and negativity and we decided that he wasn't dying of ALS that he was living with it and that perspective changed everything it changed our life it changed how how we saw the world it changed how we behave and and we decided to have a child and he would live on and so we had a daughter Maddie and four years after that we had a beautiful son so we had our perfect family and we were so grateful and um, you know there was there was there was a lot of <laughs> ups and downs. My husband was uh, extraordinary. In I mean, they compare ALS to being buried alive in a glass coffin. Oh so my gosh! It would be like me saying to you to challenge you to say you know sit on your hands through this whole interview and don't move, don't scratch your nose. You know, right? <laughs> um, because we take all this for granted. Yeah, we do. So sometimes, as a caregiver, we see the world in a different way, and it and it actually makes our world more rewarding. Yes, because we know what can be lost, and many of us forget about that. So I watched my husband, so brave, you know, go from driving this motorcycle, this Paul McCartney look-alike with the motorcycle, to being in this big electric wheelchair that was so cumbersome and and he couldn't hold his head up and people would like cross the road to avoid him or I remember coming out of a store once and somebody tried to give him money as if he was a beggar and it was just ridiculous like people just don't know how to deal with no people people don't people have no clue and and Stephen would laugh he was so brave and right you know and he he worked towards finding a cure for ALS. He he actually went to the states, and you know there was a Senate meeting that he attended in Washington. He met um, the Duchess of York, who's very involved, Sarah Ferguson mm-hmm. in ALS. So he was like my hero, my role model, watching him. And Stephen lived nine years. Incredible, awesome. Yeah. And I and I attribute that to having purpose and. That's what life is all about, having purpose. Yes. Having something to get up for every day. And for him, it was his son and it was his daughter. And, you know, I mean, of course, he dreamt of teaching his son to fish and, and, you know, all these things um, that sadly, you know, wasn't to be. Um, but, But, yeah, he was able to dream and he knew that he would live on through both of his children. And, um you know, when, when he did pass away, there was, he was, he, he fought as long and hard. I think it's extraordinary to go nine years with ALS. Sure. Um, always proud, uh, always positive. And he actually held on. I was actually in the military for 20 years, so I'm, I'm retired. Oh, sorry about that. So, I said 10. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, that was a long 10 years if it was 10. <laughs> yeah, I understand. No, I'm kidding. But, um, we moved back to my hometown, which is Hamilton, Ontario, and 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 I think my husband held on long enough to have a house built to get me home here, where my family and friends were, and passed away like very shortly after. So right there was a sign for me. It was like, you know, this this whole idea that I don't want to say that he chose when he was going to die, but he certainly 
he, there was there was an aspect of that for sure. Mm-hmm. There were things that he needed to do, and he needed to get his family home, and he needed to know they were taken care of. And I remember watching him our brand new house, and he's sitting looking out the window, watching his children play in the backyard. And I think he said, "Okay, I can go now." And he died in his sleep that night. And actually, his favorite hockey team lost their game. I think that night, and it was like, "Okay, we're not going to the Stanley Cup." <laughs> Right. It can happen now, you know. Yeah. So, so very peacefully in his sleep. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, he's one of my heroes, sure. definitely. So so that's my husband's story, my experience with him. And as difficult as it was to lose a husband, and it is, um, I always, again, knew that he would live on through his two children. And then, sadly, Our daughter, Madison, was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 12. Wow. So, again, it's like, this was a hard one for me because I, I I just, they meant everything to me, my two children, right? Of course. And I lived for them. And um, they deserved so much more. They had lost their dad. And um, so, so... Yeah, it was a challenge, and my daughter ended up in the hospital uh, to undergo one year of chemotherapy and radiation. She had bone cancer. She had Ewing sarcoma. It's pretty aggressive. You have to hit it quite hard, you know, especially with these young kids. And, um, you know, we'd come home, and we would sneak my son into the hospital. And because I was a widow, um, you know, I had no one to take care of my son. Right. How old was he? So he was... um, She was 12. So four years different. So he was eight, eight years old. Okay, yeah. And we were very blessed that my brother, Kevin, uh, never had children of his own. And he was sort of an adoptive dad. So we we, we combined um, father, uncle, and we got Funkle. That's so fun. <laughs> he, yeah, so he was Funkle Kevin. And he was like a big kid. And so he moved into my home and, uh, and was here for my son. And then, you know, we were back and forth. We weren't a full year, but every, like my daughter would have treatment for a week, come back to the home and, you know, within 24 hours have a raging fever and go back in. So we were, it was, we were there quite often. And um, so here she is and her world's changed because there's not a lot she can do. She can't play with friends. She's always has a fever. She's weak, chemotherapy, all that stuff. She's her little bald head. And then. One day she's watching a show on TV. Actually, she was um, channel surfing. You know how we all do that? Yep. Hundred channels and nothing to watch. Right. You know? Always. So she's she's just playing around with that. She's totally bored. And and then she came across this vision, and it was a World Vision um, commercial. And they're talking about a little boy walking down a dirt road, and it was so sad. Um, you saw fleas and you know, fly, flies and fleas and big eyes and big belly. And, you know, they're saying that this little boy had no parents, um, no education, no nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, lost in the world. And then they showed all these other kids. And I, I remember my daughter turning to me and saying, Mom, we have to do something. We have to, like, help this little boy. And I remember looking at her and thinking, you know, with her little bald head and all these IVs in her arms and mm-hmm. that, and thinking, like, I just want to get you better. Like, yeah. I, I was a little selfish. I was more focused on my daughter. But she said, but mom, he has no dad. He has no mom. And she was grateful for what she had, but she also, and this is so important for all of us who go through challenges, is that she had empathy for this little boy because she knew what it was like to lose a parent. Yes. So when we have these experiences, when these things happen to us and, you know, it makes us a better person, actually. Yeah, I would agree. If she hadn't gone through that, she may not have really connected. And even though it was through a TV screen, she connected with this little boy and wanted to help him. So she had that on her mind and then the doctors called her and she went away. And I kind of put it out of my mind because, of course, I'm trying to like everything is about getting her better, taking care of my son. And that's it. Yep. And so a couple a couple of months later, she sees a show about Craig Kielberger, who was 12 years old. I started an organization called Free the Children, and she was and he actually didn't live far from us. And so she was fascinated. She's like, 
mom, he did that at 12. So he was modeling what 12 year olds could do. And, you know, a lot of times young kids don't realize that they have so much power to change the world. Yes, you're right. Regardless how old, regardless of your circumstances. So, so he was kind of a spark and inspiration for my daughter to think, huh, maybe I can do something for this little boy. But again, how and what? And then the third thing that fell into place that was so powerful was that my daughter was unexpectedly um, visited uh, by this woman that she'd never met. And she was from an organization called um, the Children's Wish Foundation. And she offered my daughter a wish. And she said, you can have anything you want, anything in the world. Well, she was just over the moon excited. Of course, because you have thoughts of you know trips to Disney World or who knows what right absolutely absolutely and so she was yeah she was pretty excited and she's like do I have to decide right now like could you imagine like <laughs> and the girl's like no go home and have fun and and, and uh-huh. think about it sure right? so she comes home and she tells her brother and she's excited she has this wish and I'm packing my bags because I'm going to Disney World because I just want to get away from the cancer mm-hmm. and um, I think even our dog was in on it <laughs> he was kind of like going through the magazine too it looked like his paw was like going I, I need this and this so yeah. I'm not so sure but it, it was it was a nice distraction sure you know, to have this opportunity but then she came to me and she was serious you know the serious look on her face and she said mom There are a lot of things that I want, but there's nothing I really need. And she said, do you think they'd be upset if I gave my wish away? Oh. And I'm like, what do you mean, honey? She's like, I think the little boy in Africa needs my wish more than me. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. And so that's what she decided. She decided she'd use her wish to build a school in Africa. And she called Craig because his organization does that. And she said, I'd like to gift my wish to your organization so you can build a school because I know how important education is and that's the way out of poverty for these children. And so she arranged that and she did it without telling anyone because my daughter was painfully shy and she didn't do it for kudos. She mm-hmm. didn't, she, it was like, it was, it was between her and them and that's all. And I believe if my daughter had lived, um, nobody would have known that she did that. And I think there are thousands, tens of thousands of everyday heroes that do extraordinary things. And I'm sure you've had some on your radio that, you know, like just people don't know. And I wish we really celebrated that more. Right. Um, You know, because it's so, because sometimes we don't see it if it's not in the media but we need to know it's still going on because we have this negativity bias right where we remember all the negative but there's so many beautiful moments in our days that we don't even pay attention to or recognize so you know this was just one of those so my 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 daughter gives away her wish and the children start writing to her and she's all excited and goes into remission goes into grade nine high school so excited um but because she looks different with her short hair, she gets bullied. She doesn't want them to know she has cancer. Oh boy. So she goes through this difficult time. But her highlight was knowing that the school and these children. And then sadly, the cancer came back. And we knew then we were in a lot of trouble uh, because of how aggressive it was and chemo resistant. And again, back into the hospital. And my daughter learns that she cannot, um, the girls, could not attend school because they had to haul water. So she was so upset, as you could imagine. Uh, you give away your once in a lifetime wish, and now um, these beautiful young girls couldn't benefit from it. Only the boys, because the girls the- had to haul water. Yeah, they had all these chores, and oh, and so so it's kind of you know kind of defeating. You know, like mm-hmm. kind of got the air out of her sails, and she's she was a little bit sad about it. And then we talked about it, and that, and then. What she realized is that you don't need a wish to change the world. You only need to wish to change the world. And and the wish is in the why, why you're doing it. And she realized that she could still figure out something else. And what she ended up doing was selling jewelry out of her hospital bed. And she thought the doctors were rich and that they could buy all this 
jewelry. Wow, and what a smart kid. I know. It was so cute. And and I wish I had a picture, and I don't, but her, her hospital room was transformed, if you could imagine. All the walls, the windowsills filled with um, necklaces and stuff. And then what was kind of cute was that the doctors, instead of coming in, poking her with needles and stuff, they were they were like, hey, Maddie, how's it going? High five. Um, and um, she, she really... Uh, had a lot of fun and started coming out of her shell and being more confident and she was able to raise enough money to build uh, her well so so that a well would be placed by the school so the girls could get the water while they're in class oh that's brilliant uh huh beautiful yeah. yeah and and so she was delighted about that and and then she allowed her story to be shared because I, I think maybe Maybe she knew she was going to die. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not sure about that, but I kind of had a sense of that um, because the cancer continued to spread and uh, took her life at the age of 15. Wow. She never made it to Africa. I have, and my son has been there a couple of times. We've raised a quarter of a million dollars well, because a little girl didn't need her wish and have transformed the lives of you know thousands of, of young kids. My son and I have worked hard in keeping her legacy alive and um, so rewarding beautiful beautiful Sharon thank you for sharing you know what it does is it just like when your daughter heard about the other 12 year old making a difference by hearing this I I can't think of one of us that's probably not looking to see where we could make a difference in our own lives you know yeah And and so there's the legacy and I think that's a huge part of living on I think there are different ways and one of them is leaving a legacy right yeah so, so, oh, <laughs> so that was in- incredibly tough. I, I, I've never lost a child, um, but I've experienced grief, and I can't even imagine losing a child as extraordinary as she, she was. Um, because the title of this show is is We Don't Die. Do you feel that um, Maddie has lived on? I do. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. How come? What do you? What do you got? What do you think? What's happened? And well, Stephen too. I I don't know, but whatever you want to share in that department. Definitely, definitely stronger with my daughter, more so than my husband. But maybe because of my own work that I've done, my own spiritual work that I've done on myself. Mm-hmm. I, I think because sometimes if you're really not in touch, you don't see signs. And so I've definitely seen a lot of signs after my daughter had passed away. Uh, very um, interesting things that happened. Um, one of the, like, like immediately, like, oh, geez, let me think. I remember at the time of her death, um, I was talking to the doctors and and I had asked for her to get her last rites Mm -hmm. and she was in a coma and she'd been in it maybe about two days I think and I didn't want to accept the fact that she was dying and then so I was very torn I was torn between me do I um, do I have a doctor coming or I mean a priest coming give her her last rites will that scare her yeah <laughs> will, sure or will she give up if she's if she's still you know connecting with me like will she say oh okay this is it and go right and and so and so I, I wanted a sign that I was doing the right thing and um and it, what happened was really actually disturbing but I, I overheard um a doctor saying that you know my, my daughter was going to go soon and um so I thought okay Sharon wake up and do something and so so I went to see the social worker I said can you please bring a priest in for my daughter to be blessed so they called one in um, he came in right away uh, and blessed her and I kept saying you know please 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 give me a sign I just I was a mess and of course <laughs> so then the, the the priest turned to me and he said um, oh what's your daughter's name I said Madison he goes what's her last name and I said Babano and he said oh he says, my wife is a Babineau. And I said, really? And I said, where from? And he goes, from Moncton. And that's where my husband's from. Hmm. So, so I'm thinking, how could this random priest in this town I don't live in, 
who's giving the last rites to my daughter be somehow connected to my husband who's waiting for my daughter right, <laughs> you right. know and I'm like oh wow and so I just kind of like that's that's interesting so I felt a little better and then um after he finished um, giving her her last rites, a tear rolled rolled down her cheek. Hmm. Now, they had been giving her um, eye drops because they're not blinking or anything in the coma and there's no tearing or anything. And so all of a sudden this tear rolls down her cheek and I turned to him and I, again in panic, I said, look what we did. We scared her. And he said, how do you not know that's not a tear of joy? And I'm like, right. Wow. You know, and I, I I just remember just looking at her and kind of wiping her tear and, and thinking that tear shouldn't be there, you know, physically. And um, so then the doctors called me away and we had a meeting and they said, um, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, and I said, do you think she will die today? And they said, it's possible. I said, should I be calling my family and friends, those that aren't here? And he said, yes. I asked the social worker that they pass please pass me my um, my phone book so I could make some phone calls. And for the first time ever, I said out loud, I said, Maddie can go. I give her permission to go. And when I said that, what happened was in her room where she was, my sister was with her, and the machine crashed. It just, all the alarm bells went off. And someone ran down the hall and said, get Mrs. Babineau. And so I ran back in the room and the doctor turned to me and he said, I guess it was her decision. And it was like, I finally gave her permission. And so I just, my son and I crawled into her bed and held her oh. as she passed. And um, so part of it for me is like, she must see something more beautiful on the other side <laughs> because she chose to go in that moment. I, she waited, she suffered and waited for me to say she could go. And, and so in a way that was comforting for me. Right. Because... I don't know what's on that other side, but I believe it's beautiful, mm-hmm. peaceful. And so she was like, like she couldn't let go. And, and I'm sure you hear that from a lot of people. Sometimes they won't die when their loved ones are in the room. Yeah, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And they're holding on for us, not for them. So so it's like, <laughs> yeah, the holding on is for us. And um, they want to be free because they, they, they know something we don't know, I believe. And so one of the things that started happening was rainbows would appear all the time. Um, on the anniversary of my daughter's death, um, we met at her gravesite. We released 100 beautiful balloons, mm. and she, um, all her friends were there, and, and we were all celebrating. We were all kind of chatting, and then somebody gasped, and we looked up, and there was two double rainbows, and it was a clear, sunny sky. And, oh, I love, love, yeah. love those stories. Yes. And, they danced, so these these balloons danced up into the rainbow, and the name of the cemetery is called the Gate of Heaven. Oh. And it was like entering the Gate of he- Heaven. It was like they went right up where she was, and, and we all just kind of smiled, and even her dog, who was standing at attention with the balloon tied to his tail, her mm-hmm. little fat pug, who she adored and then um, a recent sign that we just had was my dog just passed away um, this summer which was Maddie's dog and my son and I were with him and I as we as we left the vet I said to my son um, I I wish we had a sign I wish we had a sign from Maddie or something that Winston's okay and so of course we looked up at the sky and it was a clear sunny day and we laughed and then we went for a walk on the beach and sat down by the water and I had a blanket and I leaned back and all of a sudden I looked up and I tapped my son on the shoulder. I'm like, um, do you see what I see? He's like, um, you mean those rain, the rainbow above us? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. Am I insane? He's like, no, there's a rainbow. And it, it was like my daughter saying, I got Winston. Oh yeah. And it, you can't explain it. It was a beautiful, sunny, cloudless day. And, and, and so I have, my daughter's friends write to me or email me and say Maddie comes to them in a dream at a very important time in their life. Her best friend had had um, um, on her wall in her bedroom, she had little posty notes with all her friends' phone numbers yeah. on them and their names. So she would easily be able to like call them when she wanted to. So the day of my daughter's funeral, she came home the night before 
the day my daughter died, I guess, and um, one of the notes had fl flittered to the floor and was upside down. So she walked over and picked it up, and it was Maddie's. Oh. And so it had just sort of like left. It was like I'm leaving this earth. So it came off the wall and, and flittered to the ground. And so she picked it up and she brought it and put it in the coffin. And, and she, you know, said, "I know, and that Maddie will always be connected to me." So, I mean, I see a lot of little things or just reminders from her all the time. But you have to be open to see it. You do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a yeah. bolt of lightning. I mean, it really little, little little things. Little things. Having picking something up with a saying that they said or whatever. I think if you open your heart instead of closing it, you will experience extraordinary things. So, I mean, I I I, I see there's the legacy that we we all leave behind. I mean, thinking of how we're, you know, we either we live it, you know, we live it. Um, like my daughter who 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 left a legacy because she you know she left this beautiful legacy with her wish um sometimes we we lose the opportunity to leave a legacy somebody who lives in fear and doubt and they never take action because they're afraid or whatever those are the people i'm more sorry for that that maybe um didn't live their life fully and then there are people who learn it by have second chances you know um in a car accident and survive or something like that and then you look at life differently right the, it's the wake up call and i think all all of those play into to our legacy um that we leave to the world so we have the legacy we leave to the world and then i, I think also for ourselves, we need to evolve in this lifetime because i believe that consciousness lives on and what i do in this lifetime will impact wherever my soul and consciousness goes. And I think, um, the, you know, the opportunity here is for us to be better people. Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, not, don't be afraid of death, like so much that you can't live and take chances. And, and you know, um, I, I heard someone say this, like, I can't remember, I heard it secondhand, but they said, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, it's it's not like you get to be Cleopatra next time. It's like if you don't do well in grade seven math, guess what? Oh no, you're coming back in grade yeah. seven. Yeah. Like, like we got to figure it out in this lifetime as much oh. as we can. Like we really, really do, and it takes work, and it's hard, and it's it is, but it's rewarding. It's beautiful. You know, like in, in your midlife, you know, people think they're having a breakdown, but you're having a breakthrough because you've lived, you've done everything, and you're waking up to what's true, and it's in your heart, and it wants to come out, and so you walk away from things, you do crazy stuff, and, you know, your your, your friends want to lock you up, but no, do it. Like, live an extraordinary life. Like, my, my two heroes, my husband and my daughter, every time I think that they're not here, it makes me want to work harder because I am here. Yeah, that's a great way. It's like we can cause our own wake up call, you know. Um can you talk a little bit about fear because it all, it sounds great to go after your dreams and live and all that, but fear stops so many of us. It does. And and so there's a few different things about that. Um one of the beautiful opportunities that I had um was and I didn't think it was at the time, but when my daughter was dying, she made me promise her I'd be happy. And um, you know, when you make a death yeah. promise to someone, you better fulfill it. Sure. I wasn't happy at the time when I made that promise. I didn't like it because I was living in fear. Yeah. And and my heart was closing. And so she said, Be happy and and, and I understood why. You know, my son needed someone who was happy because we model, right? How we live. Yes. And so um, I didn't even know how to be. I, I was in fear, deep, deep, deep fear. And what happened was being a soldier and fighting, fighting, fighting was I had to disarm. Uh, and, 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 it, and it brought me to my knees. It was like I had to surrender and say, whatever this is, I needed to heal. Instead of close, I had to open my heart. Um, and, you know, the, the way the fear drives us, um, we... We think we're in danger all the time, or or we're we're um, um, how do I say that? Um, yeah, we feel threatened. It's an awful yeah. feeling. 
and like this gut like sometimes they say oh your gut like sometimes the gut doesn't like something that's out of the comfort zone but it doesn't mean it's bad so right. um one of the things i did actually was i i um i had lost my job so <laughs> i had a lot of free time <laughs> too much too much free time i lost my job because i was caring for my daughter but I realized now it was a blessing. So because I ended up going on a spiritual journey, and I, I recommend it to everybody, and and I and I got into the teachings, and I got to study a little bit um, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Thich Nhat wow. Hanh was another one. I got to attend a retreat with him, and and I really got. To, and then I also studied the neuroscience of the brain, and so I learned that we have a negativity bias. We remember the bad more than the good, even though there's more good things happening in our life. They don't go into our long-term memory the way um, a, a, a bad incident or, you know, someone even just gives you the, the wrong look. And so I had to um, basically go back and retrain my brain through meditation and, and soul searching and writing and journaling, all these things that's always recommended to us because I didn't want to take a pill and I didn't want to um, no. mask what was happening yeah. in my body. So I really got in tune with my body. And meditation is one of the, the greatest way to find out what's really going on. And um, and and yeah, so so I realized you got to go through fear. It, it, I mean, just think of when you're a kid and you jump off the high high diving board. Oh my gosh! Once you do it, your consciousness knows you you'll be able to get up and do it again. It's like like there's a new knowing, and it's it's pretty pretty amazing and you just keep going to that next step and that next step and and um, and the world will open up in front of you absolutely without a doubt and so am I afraid of death no I I'm, I'm not because a I, I believe I'm gonna live on mm-hmm. uh, you know it's, it's it's the living that's hard <laughs> yes it is <laughs> It's the living that's hard. And we're so afraid to live. And we're so afraid to die. And then we're paralyzed. And then we lose meaning. Right. And I think of anything my daughter taught me is like, take your focus off yourself and put it on somebody else. And you can be heroic. Absolutely. Gosh, you, you just, I'm taking notes as we talk. And there's just like so many gems. And to just back up just a little bit, there's so many of us that are hard on ourselves. We have a lot of negative thinking, even though there's good in our life. And it, what a relief to hear that we're kind of programmed that way as human beings. Like, that's not our fault. It's not. (laughs) It's like, oh, well then, we don't have to blame ourselves anymore. Well, and that, you know what, you just said the word, the because when we're hard on ourselves, we blame ourselves, and blame leads to shame. Yes. You're paralyzed. How are you supposed to come from that place? So if you can be kind, and I, oh, I was there. I hated myself. I hated myself for not finding a cure. Yeah, and then, oh, yeah. And and then I learned a technique for self-compassion, and I, I put an image of myself in front of me during a meditation. And I thought if that wasn't me, if that was anybody else, anybody else in the world, 7 billion people in the world, if I put someone in front of me who had gone through what I went through, how would I treat them? I would have so much compassion for them. You poor girl. Let you me love- give you a hug. Let me, you know, yeah. take care of yourself. Yes. Absolutely. So I had, to, I had to distance myself from myself to give me compassion, self-compassion. And there's some amazing books out there, Tara Brock, Christian Neff, these people who talk about self-compassion. It is so powerful because we think if we beat ourselves up, we'll be stronger, but we don't, we don't. It just drives you down. Right. Right. Can, Exhausted. When we're done with this, can you email me a couple of those names for the self-compassion books? Because what yeah. I'll do, um, and for our listener, if you go to We Don't Die Radio, Dot com. By the time you're listening to this, I'll have those links under, uh, you'll see Sharon Babineau's picture and a link to this episode and then also some of the links. Because I think all of us uh, could, it would do some good to learn some self-compassion because we are so brutal on ourselves. Oh my gosh. And how does it feel? <laughs> uh, it never feels no, good. we're never good enough. And, you know, just recently I read a book and one of the practices, it was by a doctor and he, he says you can call it meditation or uh, relaxation, but it's to really be focused on the body, have our eyes closed, really feel 
grounded feel where your feet are touching where your back is touching and breathe deeply pay attention to the breath and as thoughts come up because he says the thoughts that come up when we're meditating are the same thoughts that come up during during the day and he said if you can identify what the feeling is behind the thought like I feel fear I feel resentment I'm not being present or I feel out of control he's like it's a different part of your brain that is used to identify it and it and you can let it go and it's so interesting because I've only been doing this four days and so as those feelings come up during the day whatever the anxiety is whatever the thought it's like I'm letting it go and then also to keep a journal of like things I've done as opposed to things I haven't done um, you know the, it, people always say you know make a list of uh, things you're grateful for and it's so easy to say but if we are not trained or like our brain machinery is remembering the bad and not the good to put in some practices of looking at the good look at what has been done look at what you're grateful for I think you could, you could really probably transform your life and wouldn't it be nice if we were taught this like in grade five yeah oh yeah yep <laughs> This stuff got missed, and like I mean, this is stuff that science is just understanding now with fMRIs and, and linking up uh, meditators, you know, to these fMRI machines. And so, um, um, what's his name? Uh, it just uh, Rick Hansen. So he talks about, and this is exactly what you you said. And I was doing this. I didn't realize this when my daughter told me to be happy, and I, I would just um, try to find something to be grateful for and meditate on every day. So. The technique I was doing, I did not understand, but the journaling and all this comes to um, the fact that, you know, I was saying we, we have a negativity bias, so we, you know, everyone remembers what they were doing on 9-11. Everyone remembers things that have an emotional connection to it. Um, so when you get a compliment, it goes <laughs> in one ear and out the other. So we have to work harder at taking in the good. So when something bad, even something as quick as someone gives you a dirty look, boom, it's in your long-term memory. It's got, it's got a higher emotional quotency to it. And then something nice happens. And unless you actually stop, take a breath, say, oh, that person said I look nice, hold it, feel it in your body for like 15 seconds. Then it'll go in your long-term memory. So it's going, in, it's going into a, a good feeling bank account, whereas your bad feeling is full and the good we don't we don't take that 15 seconds we weren't taught to do it but when you're journaling you're kind of doing that you're marinating in it you're recalling it. it's like yeah so that's why it's so powerful the journaling the meditation on feeling good and then you know what don't believe your thoughts like people meditate and I'm a meditator and I, I teach it I'm a mindfulness specialist so it because it's a huge part of my healing process mm -hmm. so um when, when the they sit down and meditate. So I can't turn off my brain. Well, A, you, you know that's right and you're not supposed to. And then it's like, I have so many thoughts. Well, B, those thoughts were always there. You didn't know it. Right. Um, so you just think of your mind as a clear blue sky and your thought as a cloud. So you acknowledge it, but then you don't, okay. So you might think, oh, I need bread. Okay. So what, the thought comes up and then you just allow it to like float by like a cloud. Now, if you start writing out your grocery list in your head, then, <laughs> then you've totally been distracted. So come back to the breath, pay attention to the breath, like just catch the breath as it comes in and just under your nostril and your upper lip. Put your focus there. Meditation is like a skill. You have to over, over, over again. Mm -hmm. Can't be a good basketball player by hitting a basket once. So, um, and practice that and then you're able to um, be an, an observer of your thoughts instead of being drawn into it, right? So a thought like, yeah, I'll sit there meditating and I'll have a thought about somebody I don't like and, and my whole body's get angry. So then you have like, <laughs> you have a chemical reaction. Sure. It's a refractory period where it's going to stay. So if you can just go, oh, okay, that was a random thought. Like, don't believe your thoughts. We don't know that, but don't believe every thought you have. Yeah. Most of them are not the truth. Right. They just, your your mind, if you're not focused on something, it goes into what's called a default mode. So it'll just click over and say, give me a file somewhere. And the most crazy things will come up. And then you, you, you think they're there for a reason they're not. They're just, so you just ignore them. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. When you journal, Sharon, do you think when you get some of these things out of your head and into like paper that they uh, come out, they're not, they don't show up as much in your mind? Is there any wisdom to that? 
Yes, because, you know, what you resist persists, right? Right. So as soon as you shine a spotlight on something, you give it attention. So your body, and your body communicates through feelings, right, and your mind through the words more so. So so when you journal, how like it's good to also, how does this make me feel? So this happened, how did it feel? It's good to go to the feelings. And then because um, the body will present its bill to you if you ignore it long enough. So someone who's in a, a situation that's very unhealthy and they don't know how to say no, the body will say no to you by, by creating an illness so that shuts you down. So, so you know, if you're overworked and, and you never take time for yourself, which is what we do, we mm-hmm. give up the most thing we, we need to do for ourselves to help others. So if you can't say no, the body will say no. You'll end up in the doctor's office with an illness because uh, you gotta pay the you gotta pay the bill at some point. Yeah. We're not machines. We're not machines. No, and the body will slow itself down, like like you said, by uh, It'll sending. To take a break. Yeah. How about you were talking about making a difference? I, you know, I know gratitude's a great tool to kind of shape, shift our thoughts and our happiness and things like that. But speak a little bit about how we can make a difference. And I, time goes by so. F- fast on these interviews I'm already looking how long we've been on I'm like oh this has got to come to a close soon but well, just just like I, I love leaving yeah. myself and people empowered especially you know I don't uh, to our listener I don't know when in time you're listening to this but when it's being recorded it's just um, it's in December it's prior to um, the holidays and there can be a lot of sadness and memories that spring up and negative thoughts and stuff but there is this gift that we we can all do and that it is making a difference and just if you could share and speak a little bit about the power of that and maybe you know just looking forward to some of the things we can do because it it does make a difference like your daughter um, helping build the well in Africa and, and building the school but there's also little things that we can do that not only make a difference for others but and by doing it, it makes a difference for us right Absolutely. I, I think um, I think we all need to take a little bit of time to, to, to really look at what is important, you know, what is our purpose, because it is different for everyone, and not mm-hmm. everyone does great things. Uh, small things are just as important. Um, and so if we can bring clarity to what it is. So this is a perfect time of the year to write down, you know, what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to be remembered by? And, like, I'm not talking about you know, when we think of legacy, we think about typical stuff like what we leave in a will, our money, our houses and trinkets, but no, it's about who did we touch? What is the difference we made in someone's life? Because that will far outlast any possession we could possibly leave behind. I'm talking about a personal legacy. And our legacy is created by our daily snapshots. They will create a beautiful mosaic photograph of you at the end of your life. What do you mean our daily snapshots? What do you mean? So a daily snapshot, I'm talking about, you know, did you hold the door open for a stranger today? Uh, did you yell at somebody? Like these little, everything we do is, is imagine somebody taking a picture of that, you know, whether you're kind or angry. And then imagine a huge mosaic picture of you at the end of your life. So every, what I'm saying is every action you take counts. So you can change the world in a positive way. You can change the world in a negative way. So realizing A goes to B goes to C goes to D. So um, so think before you act, really, and have that purpose and, and motivation today. You know, set a purpose every day. Today I'm going to be kind. Today I'm going to be patient, and even just focus on one quality every day. And you you start seeing through that lens. You know, where did you see kindness today? You might see because unless it's in your awareness. You're not going to really see it. So intention is everything. Living with that intention. So um, you know, we lead by example, and it's it's we we really need to. Um, how can I wrap it up so easily? I, I, <laughs> well, I you can't. But it, but it, but but if we can just realize yeah. and we do, we think is like okay, I'm going to change the world in five years, or I'm going to do something, or I don't want to. But every action creates a reaction so that's what I mean by that snapshot so 
I'm, I have snapshots of me that are probably not so kind, and then I have amazing ones, right? Well, you're human, and, and you know, exactly. we have to have compassion for ourselves because we are human, and, and yeah. you know, but this might be the wake-up call. This this listening right now might be a wake-up call for all of us, you know, that what's been going on in our mind is maybe not our fault, but how we can create a good life and I love the snapshots because you know it's so funny when you talk about that awareness um, and and creating something uh, I think about I know people that book a ticket to Hawaii and before long I mean they're seeing people with Hawaiian shirts everywhere and just anything that's got a beach on it it's like it's on the forefront of their mind so if you do say I'm going to be kind today yeah. you will notice the kindness you will notice whatever you know, and it, it's just as easy as opening a door for somebody or smiling or, you know, I often let people with just a couple of groceries go in front of me at the grocery store. You know, it's just it's simple. It, but to look for it and maybe even make it a game and um, you can even create a little log book of the, you know, things you do. And so put your attention on the good. Perfect. You're amazing woman, Sharon. <laughs> amazing. Um, How can we find more about you? I will attach, you know, the books that you've mentioned and your website to That's we don't write die radio.com. But do you want to tell us in case somebody wants to look right now? Um, so my website is uh, mindbreak.ca. So you, you probably have that. I am revamping my website, um, which should probably happen over the next couple of months. But okay. you can always find me out there because I think my name's everywhere on the internet. Um, my daughter's book is a, a, a beautiful story. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to have been able to have it published and um, very inspirational for anyone who wants um, a story for a young teen or I, I've, I've even had like a, a football player <laughs> read it and cry. So it's you know, from from 12 year old to 90 year olds can, can benefit from it. So um, to me, that's you know, I, I just love my daughter's story and love sharing that. Um, yeah, and if you have the links, that's great. If anyone wants to give me a shout out, I'm always honored to hear from people. Um, my wish is for everybody that, you know, they can um, live their life uh, fully in a way that they're, they're, they're not afraid because once you stop being afraid, and I, I've been afraid many times, Yes. the world will change and you will change and all for the better. Yeah, so true. So true. Sharon, Sharon, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm just looking over the notes and thinking of you and don't want it to end. But um, <laughs> for our listener, too, thank you for taking the time to listen. I really hope it's been of value to you. I want to remind you that our website is wedontdieradio.com. And I have a link there if you want to join our insiders club and put in your name and your email address you can get some um, some great tools and, and read some of my book and uh, and learn how to make more of a difference out there and my name is Sandra Champlain I, I do say I hope you've enjoyed it I know I have I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important and what our fabulous guest Sharon Babineau said that I, I wrote this down because it's so important you know you really don't need to be granted a wish to change the world you only need to wish to change the world so maybe today we each look into our heart and look at the ways we can make a difference and take some of those small actions today and imagine those snapshots of yourself that are in your mosaic of all those great times that you are making a difference and know that it's human nature maybe to remember the bad so we need to do our part to create our life as good and happiness so again this is Sandra Champlain thank you for listening and we'll see you soon <music>